the great king over all the earth. Let us pray. Oh God, our God, how awesome are you. You come to us from all aspects of our life. You lead us, you direct us. And Lord, we are so grateful for your guidance as you cover our footsteps as we go through life. We are so grateful, oh Lord, that you are within us, that we're able to go into the scripture and hear and apply that to our lives on a daily basis, to be able to soak you in, oh Lord. And we know that you are above all, through all, and in all. We ask that you be with those persons who cannot be here today for whatever reason that may be. But, oh Lord, we ask that you be with those persons separated from us. Be with those who are ill, those in nursing homes, those in the hospital, and those that are battling COVID, Lord, that they need our blessings more and more each day. We ask that you be with nurses and doctors and all those persons who have been dealing with people of COVID. And we know, Lord, that they go every day and are exhausted at the end of each day. But we give you thanks for allowing them and helping them to get through to help one another. So be with us, O oh Lord, and help us to continue to be grateful for who we are through you. Bless us now as we go through this hour of worship, that you bless it to our use and us to you.
and find all kinds of items there that you might need or want or would like to have. And if you don't see something and you're thinking about it and can't find it, please talk to Linda Kusik, who is manager of the hub or those persons at the cashier's box. They'll be willing also to help you out with that. In the other corner, we have Dr. Jim Newman, who will be preaching for us on Sunday day.
Because in this very night where Jesus is talking to his disciples and giving them all this truth, he introduces the secret to his life and the secret to us becoming more like Christ, the secret to us being full of joy. And I hinted at this secret yesterday when I used a very common phrase that many of you know from Galatians 5, 22, where I said the fruit of the Spirit is joy, right? The fruit of the Spirit is love and joy. Now, those of us who are familiar with the Bible, we use that phrase, fruit of the Spirit, so many times we might miss what are we talking about? So when I say fruit of the Spirit, what am I saying? Who am I referring to? The Holy Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit is the result of His work in our life. Amen. And you see all those nine fruits of the Spirit. So what we want to do is to learn to cooperate with the Holy Spirit. And believe it or not, this was the secret to Jesus' life. Jesus did not live His life in His own strength. Think about that. If anybody ever could have lived their life in their own strength, in their own power, it would have been the Son of God Himself. But Jesus lived in the power of the Holy Spirit. Luke 4, 14 says that He lived led by the Spirit, and He lived in the power of the Spirit. And that is the only way you and I can become more like Christ and therefore get this joy, the fruit of the Spirit. And it's this night the night of John 15, the night of the last night before he died, the night, the night of the Passover meal, that Jesus introduced for the first time the Holy Spirit. Does that surprise anybody? You're thinking to yourself, well, surely Jesus taught about the Holy Spirit before the last night before he died. Well, he, he mentioned the Spirit, not the Holy Spirit. I mean, he didn't. The Spirit and the Holy Spirit is the same person, but he didn't use the phrase Holy Spirit until John 14. He mentioned the Spirit to the woman at the well, the Samaritan woman, but the disciples weren't there. Remember that story? They were out to McDonald's. Read your Bible. And they were out at McDonald's getting something to eat when Jesus had this conversation with the woman at the well in Samaria. Um, he mentions the Spirit, again, he doesn't use the phrase Holy Spirit, but mentions the Spirit to Nicodemus. Uh, again, the, the disciples aren't there. So the disciples have never heard the phrase Holy Spirit come out of the mouth of Jesus. The first time I discovered that, that alarmed me. They never heard Jesus use the phrase Holy Spirit until the night before he died. This night. Remember I said yesterday, this night is an incredible night. Well, one of the reasons that makes it incredible is because this is the night he introduces the Holy Spirit. So, since you've got your Bible, we'll go to John 15, turn back one chapter to John 14. And interestingly enough, the same exact phrase in the Greek that we saw in John 15, 11, all this I've spoken to you, that exact same phrase shows up in John 14, 25. Exact same words, in the exact same order. And my Bible translates a little bit differently, but you know now this exact same words in Greek. Verse 25 from John 14, if you'll read with me. All of this I have spoken, that sounds familiar to John 15, 11, doesn't it? All of this I have spoken while still with you. Now those words are foreboding, foreboding, because Jesus is ending. I'm leaving. And if you're a disciple of Jesus who has been with him for three years, day and night, you fall in love with Jesus. You, You've been captivated by this person, Jesus. You believe he's not only a great rabbi, he probably is a prophet of God. He might even be the Messiah of God. And he uses this language, I'm, I'm going to be still with you. Now, earlier in this chapter, John 14, 1, he says, don't be troubled. Don't let your heart be troubled. I am going away. And they're like, what? What? They stop listening. What? Well, you're going away. What do you mean? And he says, and I am going to a place where you can't, you can't come with me. Now remember, Jesus started this relationship by saying, follow me. And now he's saying, I'm going to a place you can't follow. They're freaking out. I thought this was what the life was all about. Jesus following you. And now you're saying, you're leaving and I can't follow you. Because Jesus, of course, is going to the cross. That he's going to heaven. 
And so the disciples are trying to figure out how are we going to be disciples now? How are we going to live now without Jesus to follow? And Jesus has got it all figured out. So John 14, 25, he begins to introduce the Holy Spirit. All this I have spoken and watched with you. But the advocate, um, which yeah, to me, the trace of the, uh, the word that you have for the name of the Holy Spirit in John 14, 26. Just yell it out. Help. Helper. What else? Help. Advocate. Advocate. Helper. Helper. Okay, so a lot of you have got the word helper. I, that's actually my favorite translation. Comforter. Okay, yes. My favorite translation of this Greek word paraclete, the one who comes alongside, is the word helper. Uh, my, my version in the NIV has advocate, so I'm going to use the word helper because I love that word. But the helper, the Holy Spirit, there it is. The first time we see Jesus use the phrase Holy Spirit. Then he says, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. It's three years of teaching. Jesus has said a lot. The disciples have been with them. And they did a good job of remembering. The Holy Spirit did a good job of reminding them because Matthew, one of the disciples, and John, one of the disciples, wrote down a ton of what Jesus said. Now, aren't we glad that we have Matthew, the Gospel of Matthew, and the Gospel of John? And it gives us the very words of Jesus inspired by the Holy Spirit. So this phrase, the Holy Spirit, the Helper, who the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and remind you of everything I have said to you. Now here's where it gets kind of weird. Because um, if this last night before he died, he's at the Passover meal, it's a very Hebrew kind of thing to do. They've been celebrating the Passover. Anybody know how many years? 1,300 years, Jews have gathered on Passover night. It's one of the most Jewish things you can do. And they have a ritual they go through. Probably Jesus is speaking in Aramaic, uh, the Hebrew language, the Hebrew dialect. And uh, the, all the disciples are Jews, so they're used to this Hebrew dialect, this Aramaic language. And because it's this Jewish festival, of Passover, and he's got these words that have been passed down from Moses. He's probably speaking Aramaic. So when he says Holy Spirit, they heard a Ruach HaKodesh. Ruach HaKodesh. Spirit who is holy. But, <laughs> here's where it gets weird. The word Ruach, which means spirit, also means wind. Like the it means breeze. Like it's coming off of the water right now. It means um, air. So wind, air, breeze, spirit, all the exact same word. They didn't have a word for breeze and a word for spirit. It's the same word. So when Jesus says the holy or the Ruach HaKodesh, what did they hear? Did they hear holy breath? Did they hear holy wind? Did they hear Holy Breeze? Did they hear Holy Spirit? I know you think, well, of course they heard Holy Spirit. That's because you're, you're steeped in that phrase because you know English. But I'm trying to get you to go back to hearing Jesus use this phrase for the very first time. They don't have a history of Jesus talking about the Holy Spirit. So in a night of confusion and trouble, because John 14 says, don't be troubled, in a night of fear and confusion, Jesus almost makes it more confusing by introducing this term they've never heard before, Ruach HaKodesh. Now, if, by chance, he was speaking in Greek, which it's possible he was, interestingly enough, the, the word, the phrase in Greek is pneuma, that's the word spirit, so hagias pneuma, Holy Spirit, and guess what? Just like in the Hebrew and the Aramaic tongue, in Greek, they don't have a word for breeze, a word for spirit, a word for breath, a word for wind. It's one word, pneuma. Like pneumatic tools, we get that, we get that in language in English. It's, it's air, it's breath, it's wind. So you have 
these two languages that Jesus spoke in, Hebrew and Greek, both of them only have one word for the same concept of wind, wind, breeze, air, spirit. So what I'm trying to do, I'm kind of laboring here to try to, to help you get into the disciples' mind the first time they heard the phrase, Holy Spirit. Yes? As I study scripture, Ruah in Genesis was the breath of God in creation. <laughs> Wouldn't they as Jews identify that, that word? What, what's your name? Francis. Thank, thank you, Francis. Let's go to Genesis. Why not? So Genesis chapter 1, that's what you're referring to. Yes. Um, <laughs> thank you, Francis. Well, this will be fun. Um, mm -hmm. Wow, 29, 24. Let's go. <laughs> um, so um, uh, Genesis 1, 2. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep. And the Ruach of God, the Spirit of of God was hovering over the waters. Amen. Um, now, this is an example of the Holy Spirit, but they don't know that because it doesn't say Holy Spirit. It says Ruach of Elohim. So, um, does, does it surprise you to know that the phrase Holy Spirit only shows up in the Old Testament two times? First time I discovered that, I was blown away. The phrase Holy Spirit in the whole Old Testament only shows up twice. Or is it Isaiah? Once in Job. That's it. So here we have Ruach of God, Spirit of God. And yes, Francis, I think they might have thought of this. And so when you think of Genesis 1, what do you, and you think of the Spirit of God hovering, what do you think of? Maybe a cloud? You know, this is pre-earth. So this is this wind, it's this cloud, it's this presence. And actually, this gives us not only the first time we are introduced to the Spirit, but it begins to give us an understanding of who the Holy Spirit is. So what I want to do today, if I, if I got time, is to race through the Old Testament's understanding of, of what the of who the Holy Spirit is. So put your seatbelt on, you know, your help crash helmets, because we're going to be flying. Um, and try to give you some of the background that Frank Francis just introduced to us. Because as good Jews, the disciples would have been steeped in the Old Testament, and they would have thought of these kinds of things. So, we have this idea of, of the Spirit hovering. Now, if you continue in Genesis, very next verse, verse 3. And God said, let there be light. Now, you know this verse. Look at the words, God said. Now, if you want to hold your place in... Um, uh, Genesis chapter 1, you turn to Psalm 33. Do people have their Bibles? Is, is it good for me to take the time to say yes. turn these? Okay. Yes. Psalm 33, verse 6. Look at this fascinating verse. Remember, God created by speaking, right? He said, let there be light. He said, let there be earth. He spoke. Now look at verse 6 of Psalm 33. By the word of the Lord, the heavens were made. That's Genesis chapter 1. By the word of the Lord, the heavens were made. The starry host by the, the breath. That's Ruach. Same word. The starry host by the breath of his mouth. Now, go back to Genesis 1. What we have here is in verse 2, we, have, we are introduced to the, the breath, the wind, the spirit of God. And in the very next phrase, we have God speaking, which we now know is by his breath, the world was created. So the spirit is creating. God speaks. And when, the, when, the, when God speaks, the breath that comes out of his mouth is spirit. That's the Holy Spirit. Isn't that fascinating? So God, the Elohim, speaks. And whatever comes out of his mouth, that breath is the spirit of God, the breath of God. And that breath of God is a powerful life force. If you do want to take notes, then um, let me, it may have you just write down this very, this very first phrase. And I'm going to give you five of these phrases. The Holy Spirit, number one, the Holy Spirit is the breath of God giving us life. The Holy Spirit, first thing we see of the Holy Spirit is he's the breath of God giving us life. Because when he speaks, creation happens. There is no earth. There is no life. There's nothing. But when he speaks, 
man, life leaps into to existence. Ooh, that's something just happened. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's, yes, it's, you, it's the breath of God. So <laughs> <laughs> I start over. Let's go back again. <laughs> so, um, unsurprisingly, wow, that's now really loud. Unsurprisingly. Um, you have in Genesis account now all this life being created. The earth is alive. The seas are alive. The creatures are alive. And then we get to Genesis chapter 2, right? And there we're going to see now the, the creation of, of mankind. Uh, again, life. So look at Genesis chapter 2. Uh, then, verse 7. Then the Lord God, after all the creation he's done, all the life He's created. Then the Lord God formed a man from the dust of the ground. See this next word? Yeah. And breathed into him the breath of life. So, so here you can get a picture of this. Adam apparently is like a like a mannequin in a storeroom strip no, uh, window store, store. Window sill. Wind, window. What's my for? Window display. Thank you. He's, he's, a, he's a corpse, he's a body, but there's no life in him. He's just stuck there. And apparently God breathed. Now, what's the breath of God? It's the spirit of God. God breathes into him, and now Adam comes alive. Spirit of God inside of us that makes us alive. So not only is, is the, the spirit of God the breath of God that gives us life, but second, you can write down, the Spirit of God is the presence of God. The presence of God giving us power. Because until this point, Adam was dead. He did not have the power to get up. But now that he has the breath of God, the Spirit of God been blown into him, now he has the power to get up, walk around. He's animated. He's full of life. He's full of power. He can speak. He can pick up things. His body is now has the power to do what God has created his body to do. God did not create Adam to lay in the Garden of Eden and just to be a corpse. He created him to be alive, to be full of power. So he empowers him. Are you already seeing some hints of the New Testament? That the same God who breathed into Adam to make his physical body alive is the same God who breathes into our spiritual bodies to make our spirits alive. In other words, I believe, this is so powerful to me, I believe that the very breath we breathe is a living parable from God to remind us, just like you need oxygen to keep your physical bodies alive and to empower you to live and move and have your being, so you need the Spirit of God, the breath of God, to make your spirits alive and that's the only way you can live the spiritual life, the Christ-like life, the Christian life. Amen. So let me say it this way. The Christian life is impossible to live. Amen. Unless you are full of the breath of God. Unless you are full of the breathed into you presence of the living God. I got goosebumps. Just thinking about this, that the same God who breathed into Adam and made him alive is the same God who breathes into us and makes us alive. And, and isn't this exactly what happens on Resurrection Day? The second Adam. Who's this? Jesus. Laying in the tomb. A corpse. He's just like Adam in the Garden of Eden. He's a body. His, is, his body is mangled. The cross. The flogging. But he's dead. And the Spirit of God breathes into this body of Jesus. And he comes alive. Resurrection. And so Paul uses this metaphor just as the Spirit of God brought back Jesus from the dead. So that same breath, that same Spirit is alive in you and enables you to live the Christian life. This is incredible. This is how God meant for us to live. He didn't breathe oxygen into our bodies so we can just live for ourselves in this world. He breathed oxygen into our bodies as a parable to remind us now. Remember, you need that same breath to make your spirit alive 
so you can live the Christian life, the life I dreamed for you, the life I planned for you. The purpose of God and the people of God is for us to be like Christ. And the only way we can be like Christ is to be full of the Spirit of God. Isn't that cool? Yeah. And so we have these two uh, beginning ideas from the Old Testament. Who is the Holy Spirit? Well, he's the breath of God who gives us life. Who is the Spirit of God? Secondly, he is the presence of God giving us power. Okay, so let's go back now um, to this, night, this last night with Jesus, John 14. And I said to you that in John 14, 25, it's the first time that Jesus uses the phrase Holy Spirit. But the first time he uses the word Spirit is earlier in this chapter, John 14, um, where is that? Uh, John 14, 16, okay? John 14, 16. So Jesus is speaking to his disciples, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate, another helper, to be with you forever, the Spirit of truth. There's our phrase, Spirit, there's our word, Ruach, or Numa. And notice in verse 16, he is there to help you, and he, be, he will be with you forever. So the third thing you can write down, who is the Holy Spirit of God? He is the God who is with us, helping, there's our word helper, God who is with us, helping us live. Jesus says he will be with you forever. Um, Notice how Jesus says in verse 16, he will give you another advocate. Who is the first advocate? Jesus. That's Jesus. Jesus is actually called the paraclete. He's the first paraclete. He's the first helper. He's the first advocate. He's the first one who left heaven to be with us permanently. Let me uh, bring you back to Christmas. What do we teach at Christmas? That his name shall be called Emmanuel, which means God with us. With us. In the coming of Jesus, God is now with his people. And Jesus now says, there's another with you, another God with you that will be with you. And that is the Holy Spirit. Let's just be really clear. The Holy Spirit is not an it. He's not a force. He is God. He is the third person of the Trinity. You, we address him as a he, never as an it. Amen. So the Holy Spirit is the breath of God in his life. He's the presence of God, helping us, um, uh, giving us power. And he is God himself, um, helping us to live this Christian life. And I, I, the people that I'm discipling and the people that I'm leading, I, I'm always correcting them when they use the Holy Spirit uh, and they use the word it to refer to him. I'm like, no, no. He, he, he's a he. And he's a person. And he lives in us. And he's the promise that Jesus said, I, I'm going to give you the promise of the Father. I'm going to send to you the Holy Spirit. Remember Acts 1.8? It says, um, wait for the Holy Spirit, and when He comes, He will give you power. Yeah. The Holy Spirit will come upon you. The Holy Breath, the Holy Wind. Ooh, now remember Acts chapter 2, when it says that the disciples will all gather together in, on the day of Pentecost, and the sound of a mighty rushing wind. wind. Why don't we translate that spirit? The mighty rushing spirit. It's the same word, it's pneuma. Well, because you figure out how to translate these words in the context. But what I want you to see is that when Jesus talked to Nicodemus about the Spirit in John 3, when uh, Luke is recording the coming of the Spirit in Acts chapter 2, when Jesus talks about the Spirit in Acts 14, I mean John 14, John 15, and John 16, it's the same word, pneuma, Spirit, wind, breath. And this is a parable that God is giving us to help us see how he wants us to live the Christian life. It's in the power of the breath of God who makes us alive, who enables us to live in the power of his strength, and who enables us to live the Christian life. Okay, this is so good. So uh, now let's, let's move from John uh, 14, 
Um, I mean, verse 17, John 14, 17, we just learned in verse 16, he will be with us forever. Now John 14, 17, the spirit of truth, the world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him. How do you know him? How do the disciples know the spirit? Jesus says, for he lives with you. We just said that the Holy Spirit is, is God um, in, uh, with us, helping us to live. How is it the Holy Spirit is with the disciples? By virtue of the fact that Jesus is with the disciples. You understand that the Spirit of Christ is the same thing as the Spirit of God, as the Holy Spirit, as the Spirit of the living God. All these phrases are about the exact same person. The Spirit is the Spirit of God. The Spirit is the Spirit of Christ. The Spirit is the Holy Spirit. He, it's all language to refer. He's the Spirit of truth. It's all language it's to refer to this one person, the third person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit. So Jesus says, by virtue of the fact that I've been with you for three years, you have experienced the Spirit of God. Because you've been with me, you've been with the Spirit. But now like this. Um... You know him, for he lives with you, and this should be in caps, and will be, who has the Bible going? in you. A shift is about to take place. The Holy Spirit has been with you because Jesus has been with you, but Jesus is leaving. He'll die the next day. He'll be raised three days later. He'll be ascended into heaven, and he is there now. Jesus is not with us physically anymore, but he is with us by virtue of the Holy Spirit. You see this? So he can say at the end of Matthew, I will be with you all the time by the presence of the Holy Spirit, the Holy breath of God. The Spirit of Christ is the Spirit of God who is the Holy Spirit. That's the same person. And Jesus is prophesying here, he's with you, but he will be in you. And now we come to our fourth truth, that God, the Holy Spirit is God in us, not just with us. He is God in us. Amen. What is he doing? <laughs> he is making us more like Christ. This is what we talked about yesterday. What's the purpose of the Holy Spirit? To indwell God's created beings who are made in the image of God. The Holy Spirit's purpose is to dwell in us, to make us more like Christ. To, can I say this? To holify us. We don't use that word. What's, what's our version of the word to holify us? To God. sanctify us. To make us holy. Because He is the Holy One. He's the Holy Spirit. So His, His purpose is to dwell in the, watch me, in the crown of God's creation. Well, that's, that's crazy to say. Let me put it this way. To dwell in you, the crown of his creation. You are made in the image of God. You were destined to be filled with the Spirit of God who works in you to make you more like the Son of God. That's your destiny. We learned that destiny in Romans 8, 28. He, for those he foreknow, he predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son. Now we know how that happens, by filling us with his Holy Spirit. So we are full of the breath of God, and as we learn to breathe, that's the name of my book, as we learn to breathe, we become more and more like Christ. When I say learn to breathe, I don't mean to learn to breathe physically, we already know how to do that. I mean learn to breathe the Holy Breath of God. This is the secret for every human being. Dogs can't do this. Cats can't do this. Rocks can't do this. Trees can't do this. But human beings, because they're made in the image of God, can be full of the Spirit of God and learn to breathe the very breath of God. That's spiritual oxygen. <laughs> can I say that? That's the Spirit of God who is meant to dwell in the people of God. 
And when we are living in the power of the Spirit, watch this. That is when we glorify God. Amen. That's the only way we can glorify God. By being full of the Spirit. So what's the chief end of man? The Westminster Confession asks. To glorify God and enjoy Him forever. How does that happen? When we're full of the Spirit of God. That's the only way we can glorify. My life verse is 1 Corinthians 10 31. So whatever you do, whether you eat or drink, whatever you you do, do it to the glory of God. So I live my life now full of the Spirit, full of the breath of God. I'm learning to breathe so that my whole life is lived for the glory of God. That's why I'm here. I exist to glorify God. How do I glorify God? By becoming more like Christ. How do I become more like Christ? By living in the power of the Spirit. By, by actually breathing in the breath of God. Yeah, cool. Yes. That's, that's transformative. And, and yet, who lives their life with that understanding? Do you see how far below we are living below our birthright? Amen. We're made. For the glory of God, and yet we, as C.S. Lewis says, goof around with, with this, this worldly life we live in, and we misunderstand why we're here. We're here to be full of the Spirit of God, to be living in the breath of God, so we can become more like the Son of God, the glory of God. Oh, man, that's good. Now, so, last, so yesterday, yesterday, I, I told you that... Um, when I was studying, what does it actually look like when we become like Christ? I went through the whole uh, Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and wrote down every time, every characteristic I saw of Jesus Christ. I wrote them down, then I summarized them in six core Christ-like characteristics. And I told you that I then created them into an acronym. So to help us remember how to be like Christ, C-H-R-I-S-T. So yesterday was C. We live connected to God through the word and prayer. Anybody remember that phrase? Think about now that we know the power of the Holy Spirit. How do we live connected to God through the Spirit? We live connected to God through the Word. Who inspired the Word? The Spirit. <laughs> the, the Word of God is inspired by the Holy Spirit. So the only way I can live connected to God is through the Word and through prayer, and that's the realm of the Holy Spirit. He, he makes us, he inspires the word to be written, and then he illuminates it and makes it alive for me, helps me understand it. The Holy Spirit is intricately involved in the word of God. Therefore, he's intricately involved in helping me be connected to God. So if that's C, what's the H? Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit. Yeah, you guys are tracking with me. <laughs> but you're wrong. Uh, but you're right. I mean, that, that's, that would make sense. Um, Let's go, in the brief minutes we have left, to one of those types where Jesus used the word ruach, used the word pneuma, the word spirit, but the disciples weren't around. It was in John chapter 4. So you, you turn with me to John chapter 4. Um, <laughs> oh, I love that you guys just said Holy Spirit. That's so cool. What me? But you'll see what I mean in a second when I say you're, you're right, you're wrong, you're wrong, but you're right. Um, John chapter 4 is this fabulous conversation with Jesus. And by the way, in the midst of all the racial unrest in our world right, right now, let's learn from Jesus, who goes right into the teeth of racial prejudice in John chapter 4 and freaks out the disciples. So like, whoa, 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 we can't go through Samaria. That's where those people live. That's their territory. And there was tremendous prejudice between the Jews and the Samaritans. If you know your Bible, you know this. And Jesus decides, instead of going around like every other Jew does, we're going right into Samaria. We're going to break down racial barriers. We're going to walk right into the teeth of racial prejudice. And that's what it is. It's racial prejudice. And, he, and this is why we'll talk to a Samaritan. Not only a Samaritan, but we're going to bust through gender barriers as well. I'm going to pick a Samaritan woman. You think Jesus was a revolutionary? That's why they crucified him, because he kept busting all of their, their ideas of what it looked like to be normal, what it looked like to be godly. And he busts through the racial and the gender barriers and has this conversation with this woman at the well, this American woman. 
and there's uh, so much to be said, but what I want you to see is when the, the conversation gets a little bit um, dicey, and Jesus points out to her, uh, you know, you have five guys. You live with five guys. She gets uncomfortable. So what do you do when you get uncomfortable? You change the subject. Let's talk about a subject that nobody has controversy about. Let's talk about worship. That's what's happening. In John chapter 4, um, Jesus is having this conversation, and he gets too close to home. And so she changes the subject. In John chapter 4, verse 19, I can see that you are Let's talk about worship. Our ancestors worship on this mountain, but you Jews, even to how she uses the phrase, you Jews, hear the prejudice? You claim that this place where we, where we must worship is in Jerusalem. The woman, Jesus replied, believe me, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. What was that? Helicopter. Helicopter. Oh, that uh, The time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know, but we Jew worship, Jews worship what we do know. For salvation is from the Jews. He, as the, 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 the Savior wrote, now verse 23, yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers worship the Father in spirit. That word, in numa, In spirit and in truth. For they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is spirit. spirit. He's breath. He's wind. He's, he's, he's not a physical God is spirit. His long life is word. He responds. He, he responds with the great Shema from Deuteronomy 6. It's a command. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all of thy heart. heart. Let's just stop right there. Because honestly, heart, soul, mind, and strength are all Hebrew poetic ways of saying, with everything that's in you, so. you know, with everything you are, worship God, love God. That's the greatest commandment. That's why you've been created. This is what God wants us to do. Now watch this. When we live in the sea of Christ, connected to God through the word of prayer, when we live that connected life, we remain in the vine, living like that shapes our heart. And we develop a heart of worship. Again, we don't work up worship. We live connected to God. We stay in the vine. I'm connecting last, yesterday's sermon. So you missed yesterday's sermon. You're like, what are they talking about? Here yesterday's. But if we live connected to God through the word of prayer, that shapes our heart, and we develop a heart of worship. We develop a life of worship. We develop a 1 Corinthians 10, 31. Whatever you do, do it for the glory of God. We, we develop in Mark 12, 30. Live, live your life to the glory of God. We live, live your life loving God. We become like Jesus who lived a life of worship to God. His life was an act of worship, a sacrifice of worship. He was full of the Spirit of God, so he lived his life in a heart and a life of worship. It comes from here. It comes from once you see Jesus' heart of worship, you recognize it. his whole life is God-oriented. He's, he says in John 5, I don't do anything except what the Father told me to do. I don't say anything except what the Father. I am a God-oriented, scripture-saturated, filled with the Spirit kind of human being. And I'm living the life I want to invite you to follow. A God-oriented, a god glorified a God, spirit of God filled kind of life where I live for the glory of God every day of my life. Amen. We're on a journey of becoming like Christ when you learn to breathe in the Holy Spirit and live connected to God through the word of prayer. And that spirit, he works in us and shapes a heart of worship, which is a loving response to God for who he is and what he's done. And 
every day becomes full of opportunities to live for the glory of God. Amen. Holy Spirit, breathe in us. Breathe in us. Your very presence. Shape our hearts. The hearts of worship. So they like it says in Luke 10 21, and Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, praise God with joy. So that our lives become a life of praise, a life of worship, a life of response to who you are and what you've done. So Holy Spirit, come. Live in us. Fulfill the promise that the Father gave that we might be not just people who are walking with God, but that the very presence of God himself might be in, in us. So help us to learn to be to cooperate with the Spirit of God, breathing in His presence. Inhaling the Holy Spirit of God and exhaling the toxins of self-centeredness. Inhaling your words, your life, your joy, your presence, and exhaling the toxins of sin. And thereby, living in this river, 